The size of a network is important not so much because of the sheer quantity of elements we have to deal with, but more because it sets the context for how close or far, on average, one node in the network is from another one. And this is important because it tells us how quickly something will spread through the network, and also how integrated different components in the network are likely to be. Making a connection within a network, or traveling from one node to another, is rarely free. It typically costs some resource. Whether this is the cost of fuel in traveling in a transportation network, the laying of cables to transport information, or just the risk of rejection when you ask someone out on a date. The further we have to travel along a network to get from A to B, the more it will cost and less likely it will occur. With the result being, the further we have to travel to get from one side of the network to the other, the lower the level of integration to the system is likely to be. As an example of this, we might think about the Russian Empire in the 1900s, a vast landmass spanning from Europe to East Asia, but without any coherent transportation network to connect it. It was continuously under threat of falling to pieces. With the building of the Trans-Siberian Rail Network, information, goods and resources could eventually diffuse to the different parts of the system, and it is this interaction between components within a system that gives it coherence and integration. We may be dealing with a very large system, but if there is no diffusion or interaction across the network, it ceases to function as an entire system. Two important metrics for capturing this overall distance between nodes are the network's diameter and its average path length. The diameter of a network is simply the longest of all the geodesics in the network. If we remember back, a geodesic is the shortest path between two nodes. So when we're asking for the diameter of a network, we're really looking at all the shortest paths and then choosing the longest one. And this will give us an idea of how far something will have to travel to get all the way across the network. The average path length is calculated by finding the shortest path between all the nodes, adding them up, and then dividing by the total number of pairs. This will show us the number of steps, on average, it takes to get from one member of the network to another. So we can take a real-world network and ask, what is its average path length? For example, a number of years ago, researchers studied the social network of Facebook when it had approximately 721 million users, with 69 billion friendship connections between them. The average path length turned out to be just 4.74 intermediary connections. This appears to be an extraordinarily low distance between any two members of such a large network. We can quote one of Facebook's spokespersons on this finding when he said, quote, In these two works, we show how the Facebook social network is at once global and local. It connects people who are far apart, but also has the dense local structure we see in small communities. This is what is called the small world phenomena that we'll be discussing in greater depth in a later lecture. But one thing we wish to highlight here is that this question of how close things are in a network is not just a product of the network size, but is also a product of the structure to the network, as we might expect. Looking at these two network topologies will help to demonstrate this. If we look at the diameter of the ring network on the left, we'll see that it is quite high. In fact, it is half the number of nodes in the network. If we look at the tree network on the right, we see the diameter is much shorter. Due to this branching structure to the network, which is a much more efficient way of connecting things. But the thing to note is that with the ring topology, the amount of nodes I can reach is only growing in a linear fashion relative to the amount of links I have to traverse. So if I travel one link away, I reach two nodes. If I travel two links away, I can reach four nodes. If I go three links, I can reach six nodes, and so on. And this is a linear progression. In contrast with our other network structure, if we place ourselves at the top of the tree, now, due to this branching structure, we can get an exponential growth in the number of nodes we are reaching relative to the distance we have to travel. At one step, I can reach two nodes, but at two steps, I can reach six nodes. At three steps, the whole network are 14 nodes. And it is this same exponential growth that is one of the factors behind the small world phenomena. 
allowing us to have a surprisingly short average path length, even within a very large network like that of Facebook. And thus we should be able to see from this, that even if we have a much larger network, if it has the right structure, then we will be able to reach much more nodes in a shorter path length than if the network was small but had a structure that gave it only a linear relation between distance traveled and nodes connected. And this is important because we often think about and measure size and scale in terms of some static quantity, the number of people in a city or the creatures in an ecosystem. But as networks are all about connectivity, what really matters with respect to scale is how far away you are from other nodes, which can be dramatically altered by simply restructuring the network. And thus scale becomes much more subjective and relative to the topology of the network. 